Hi again, everyone. Thank you for viewing this video, for coming to the channel, um, Mad About Madeira. Well, tonight I am doing one that's just going to be a video just with me, without my beautiful wife next to me. Um, she being here just adds so much beauty and color <laughs> to the videos instead of you guys looking at my face. But um, we did a video recently, as a matter of fact, we did it just yesterday, and in the video I mentioned something. So this video is not going to be about um, our journey to Madeira. Um, we're going to continue with that. Um, we're going to give ourselves some time to think about that so we can put our thoughts together. And that video, of course, will include my wife. Um, but this video, I just want to do it as an interim video, more or less, where I just want to explain something. And I think it's fascinating uh, to discuss this um, or to bring it up or to mention it um, because I think it's going to help to just shed some light on some things. Um, and it's going to somewhat complement or explain a few things from the first video that I did on this channel, Mad About Madeira. So anyway, um, let's get to it. Um, try to see if I can keep this much shorter than our other videos where we're talking about our journey or our visit to Madeira in March of 2022. So until we get to that, let's go ahead and go over some history, I guess you can look at it. Um, in the video that we last did, my wife and I, we mentioned the fact that I should say I noticed, and I mentioned it to my wife, I noticed that there seems to be like a lack of information. I shouldn't say a lack of information, but a lack of knowledge when it comes to um, Madeirans knowing about their diaspora. And I think Madeirans will know that there are a lot of um, descendants of people from Madeira. And I keep mentioning Madeira because there's a specific reason why I mentioned that. Because the Madeirans were the ones that, that, that came to this side of the world, the western side of the world, or again on the other side of the Atlantic, that came to the side of the world and ventured into places like New York City, into I think it's the Midwest, I think it's Illinois, Indiana, um, to Hawaii, um, to California, those places. The Madeirans were more or less the, the representatives of the Portuguese population that made it to those areas, whereby the older Portuguese, or the colonial style Portuguese, the colonial types, I guess you can say from colonial times, they went more to Brazil. Well, my wife and I, obviously, um, I've, as I've mentioned, we're from the Caribbean region. And I think it may be a surprise to some people that people that look like us, um, of course, we could pass for Brazilians also, but people who look like us, um, if we said we were from Brazil, it might not have jumped out as that big of a deal because we already know Brazil has a long colonial history um, with Portugal. But the fact that we come from islands in the Caribbean, it's not a place that you would think of when you think of Portuguese descendants. And we looked around, or I looked around, and I realized that there was not much information that filled in that gap to explain all that went on, um, went on there. Now, on an academic level, I've seen writings, I've seen books, I've seen people talking about uh, the migration of Madeirans to the Caribbean and so forth. I've seen those. But to the common everyday person on the streets of Funchal, or the common person walking around in St. Kitts and Nevis or Antigua or, or Trinidad or, or Guyana. This is not something that actually jumps out. And I have, a, um, I have a few reasons why I believe this happens to be the case and this is what I wanted to talk about. First of all, Portugal never colonized any of the Caribbean islands. Portugal was nowhere to be found. This does not mean that they weren't Portuguese who were there on those Caribbean islands, but the country, the kingdom of Portugal, never colonized any particular island in the Caribbean. They did not colonize Trinidad, the Dominican Republic, Haiti, none of those places. The only place that Portugal colonized on this side of the world, on the western side of the Atlantic, was Brazil, the country we know as Brazil today. 
That's a very, very large country. So they colonized that. But in terms of the rest of the Caribbean, they had nothing to do with those islands up there. I think the closest they came to that was, I think, on their way to Brazil, to colonize Brazil, they passed by and they saw Barbados from a distance, uh, the island of Barbados in the Caribbean, but they never made it over there to lay the Portuguese flag down and claim that island for Portugal. So Portugal never really colonized any islands in the Caribbean. So as a result, if you ask the average Caribbean person about Portugal, Portugal is not really in their thoughts as much as England, as much as France, as much as Spain, as much as the Dutch, and as much as the Danes. Because all of those places that I just mentioned, they all colonize at least one island in the Caribbean. So as a result, you go to Puerto Rico, you go to Dominican Republic, you go to Cuba, you see the Spanish influence, you hear Spanish being spoken. So you have all that going on. So there is a, re a residue of the colonial history of those islands. You go to Jamaica, you go to Trinidad, you go to Antigua, you go to St. Kitts and Nevis, you hear the English, you see the English influence, you see the British influence in those places because those places were colonized by the British. You go to places like St. Martin, the French St. Martin, where my stepfather is from, or you go to um, Guadeloupe or Martinique, you see the French influence there because the French colonized those islands, okay? But, and I forgot to mention, the Danes, for example, you go to the Virgin Islands, the U.S. Virgin Islands, where I am from, you will see the Danish influence there because Denmark in colonial times controlled those islands, St. Thomas, St. Croix, and St. John, in the US, what we call the U.S. Virgin Islands today. So, you see that. So, the people on those islands are more aware of the British, the French, the Dutch, the Danes, as I mentioned. Portugal is nowhere to be found. So if you go to a Caribbean person and mention Portugal, it just doesn't really mean anything to them because there's nothing there that they can look at that reminds them of a past colonial history under the Portuguese flag. So again, back in 1493, when Pope Alexander VI drew up his imaginary line of demarcation, everything to the east of that line was to go to Portugal and everything west of that line was to go to Spain. So Portugal's focus outside of Brazil on the western side of the Atlantic, their focus was primarily on the eastern side of the world, so to speak, or on the eastern side of the Atlantic Ocean up to the Pacific. This means portions of Africa, um, India, uh, the Indian subcontinent, Indonesia, uh, places um, in China today like Macau, and um, as far up as Japan. That was Portu Portugal's domain or their primary focus was on that side and also East Africa. So, as a result, Portugal never really had much to do with the Caribbean. So, that's one thing. The second thing is, and this is not to offend anyone, this is not to make anyone feel bad or anything, and I don't want you to think for one minute that I am the typical militant black guy, um, oh, down with whitey and so forth, and oh, those white people, I am not the type, okay? So, I want you to understand that. But... There are people in the Caribbean who may be a little bit more knowledgeable about Portugal and Portugal's history who will have a bad taste in their mouth that if you mention Portugal, they will be like, oh, yeah, they are the first European country that started the transatlantic trans slave, slave trade. Uh, they brought all these um, enslaved Africans over to Brazil. I don't want to have nothing to do with them. I don't want to hear anything about Portugal. Uh, their hands are dirty and so forth. It's not a majority of people in the Caribbean that's even thinking like that, but there are those who know history and will look and they just don't really feel too fond about a place like Portugal. So that may be another reason that they may have nothing to do with, even though they're from the Caribbean, and even though they may have Portuguese ancestry, they may still have a bad taste in their mouth when it comes to Portugal in regard to that. But there's a caveat to that. There's an explanation which I'm going to get to a little bit later on. And the third and final thing I mentioned in my last, in, in the first video, is the fact that when Madeirans left Madeira, what it seems like to me, at least with my ancestors, my wife's ancestors from Madeira, they traveled basically 2,500 miles, 2,900 miles across the Atlantic Ocean to lands that they had never been to. Some of them may have never even heard of a place known as Demerara, which we call Guyana today. 
They may have never heard of St. Kitts and Nevis, where my mother and father are from, but where my Madeiran ancestors ended up. They may, have, they may have never heard of a place known as Antigua or Trinidad, but yet Madeirans went down there um, at the behest of the English to go to work, as I explained in the first video, to go there to work and leave their depressed island because Madeira was going through some very rough times in the 1800s. And the British came along and said, hey, you don't have to stay here. You know, we have work for you. You can head on over to the Caribbean. You can head over to our British colonies like, like uh, Trinidad or British Guyana, Demerara. You can go over there and you can work and you can live a better life. And a lot of Madeirans left. Thing is, when they left and they went there, a lot of them never made it back. So that communication with the motherland was more or less cut off. So when these Madeirans had children and their grandchildren, what happened was a lot of them never really passed on the traditions to their, their, their posterity, their children and their grandchildren. So as a result, they had their children in these new lands, whether it's Trinidad, whether it's British Guyana or St. Kitts and Nevis, they had their children or their grandchildren, but because they kind of lost communication with their families 3,000 miles back across the ocean or they never went back, they more or less just assimilated into the local community and they became more British Guyanese than they were Madeirans. They became more, more Trinidadian than they were Madeirans. This is not to say they did not keep their culture. This is not to say they were not proud of their culture, but I think they did their best to assimilate in these new countries that they went into. And by doing so, over time, they just more or less just lost that. And so when they had their children and grandchildren, never passed it on. There's also another reason why I think this may have happened because it definitely happened in my family and it happens happened in my wife's family. It's the fact that it's quite interesting that when the Portuguese came down to the Caribbean, believe it or not, the British did not look at them as being on the same level as them. Because remember, when the British came to Madeira, the British considered themselves to be cultured, considered themselves to be more educated, more enlightened. The Madeirans, being an isolated, I shouldn't say an isolated island, but an island off the coast of mainland Portugal, and I think there's some tension there between mainland Portugal and Madeira in terms of how they look at one another. But just imagine back in those days on an island in the 1800s going through so much turmoil, um, uh, unemployment just being so high, the American Civil War affecting the Madeira and wine uh, situation, Napoleon invading the mainland, cutting off communication between mainland and the island, um, the famines that they had. Um, all the various things that were going on there was uh, rather difficult. <laughs> you know, my uh, thing here telling me it's updating, so I hope it's not going to turn this video off after I've done all of this. But anyway, um, so with all those things going on, not to mention the fact that in the 1800s, from what I understand, the island had a high uh, illiteracy rate at the time. Um, and it was just very a very depressed state of what was going on there. So um, what I believe was that when they showed up in the British colonies, the British didn't look at them as their kind of white, if I can explain like that, not cultured like them. So the Portuguese were in a, in a weird position, the Portuguese who came, the Madeirans who came to the Caribbean, they were in this weird situation where the British looked down on them, but the local black population did not look at them as being like them. And the British did not look at them as being on the same level. So they were somewhere in the middle, somewhere there. They weren't really this and they weren't really that. So as a result, um, you had situations where they're coming to these islands, speaking a different language. Um, and as they're there, um, they're looking around and just basically realizing that unless other Madeiran women traveled with the men and vice versa, um, they had to more or less, if they were looking to have relationships, to have children, to have sex, they had to look more or less and pick from the local population that was there. So as a result, because of the color, the, 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 the racial lines and everything that tends to be an obsession on this side of the world, you know, you would have a Portuguese man, for example, may have a child with a local woman who may be of a different race. 
and it was more or less like scandalous, you know, like, oh, ooh, ooh, wow, you know? And so it seems to me, because it happened in my family, in my wife's fa family, that it was somewhat commonplace to maybe have a child with a local woman, but then you did not claim the child, or the families created problems like, hey, how dare you go have a child with that guy over there? Do you know he's a different person, a different race, um, a different color? And it was probably the other way, the other way around. So they would have the children and then just move on with their lives. And now you have a woman with a child, um, perhaps from another race. And the Portuguese man may go about his way. Or he could have been with the women also, not quite sure. And in situations like that, you now have a child that's growing up that may not really know their father or know their grandfather as well because he's gone on to live his life elsewhere. And grandma or mom is over here with the child for him, but they don't really have a relationship with each other. So that was another thing that caused, and I'm saying this from personal knowledge within my own family. And so this may have caused situations where the communication now just did not pass on. All a woman may have known is that she had a relationship, a sexual relationship with a Portuguese man and he may not have claimed the child, put his name on the birth certificate or anything. And, you know, because you could get away with that back in those days. And he just went his way and she was there and that was basically it. So the line of communication and knowledge about Madeira and, you know, the, the continuity in terms of a family was just not there in perhaps a lot of these relationships. Again, it happened in my family and it happened in my, uh, my, my wife's family. So I'm speaking only from our experiences. This does not mean that you probably didn't have Madeirans who came there, married other Madeirans, um, had their children with other Madeirans and so forth. I'm sure that, that that actually happened because on one side of my family, I think that was the case because after my great, my paternal great, great grandmother, who was a Madeiran, um, once she lost her first husband, who was French, just a weird combination there. Once she lost her first husband, she married a Madeiran, a Teixeira. So um, there were examples of things like that also. And I'm sure that was probably um, the case with most of them. You're coming from Madeira with other females or other males from Madeira, and you more or less probably went with familiarity. But you did have those situations where you had a Madeiran man or a Madeiran woman who may have gone ahead and married someone from the local population and that caused some tensions back in those days. And by it causing some tensions, lines of communication, family just broke. And that was basically it. So I just want to just mention those type of things just to give an explanation as to why I think there is this lack of knowledge. You know, again, it's there. You can get books on this. Uh, there are academic works on this and so forth. But again, just for the common everyday person, they, they, you know, the common Madeiran might not be thinking, oh, wow, I have a bunch of family in Trinidad. Wow, I have a bunch of family in St. Vincent in the Caribbean. I didn't know I had family in St. Kitts and Nevis. I never even knew those places existed until. So same with us. You know, I had never heard of a place called Madeira, but yet it, it features prominently in my life, in my family's life. My wife had never heard about it either, and it features prominently in her history. So... We never knew of these places. Why didn't we know? Like I mentioned, these were some of the reasons that I, I, I just gave. So for us finding out about Madeira, for us finding out about our connections to a place 3,000 miles away from where we were born, you know, we knew that we were of African descent. That's undeniable just by looking at us. That's where the majority of my ancestry comes from. But we did not know. And of course, we, we looked up and we saw things like England and Scotland. And we figured that would be the case because, again, the islands where I was born, where my father was born, where I was raised, uh, where my wife was born, those islands were once under the British flag. You know, going all the way back to the days of slavery, going all the way back to the days of colonialism. So you figured somewhere along the line, there was some mixing up there, some hanky-panky going on. And you figured you would see in your ancestry results, an England, a Scotland, you know, if you're on a French island, maybe some French, you probably see that. But when we looked up and we saw Portugal, it's like, Portugal, 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 you know, it, that was really um, odd to us and it led us to Madeira. The other thing that I want to mention too um, 
is I don't know about this, and for the Portuguese who are watching this, for the Madeirans who are watching this, you can better explain, explain this more than I can. But I try to explain to people, especially the militant ones among us who are like, Portugal, oh, they were slave owners, and I don't want to have nothing to do with them. I try to explain to them that there's mainland Portugal, and then there's Madeira and the Azores. Madeira, it seems like it, I'm glad that it has its own history. So I tell them a lot of times that the people who came to the Caribbean, who ended up in the United States, who represent Portugal, because that's where they came from, where their ancestry came from, was not necessarily mainland Portugal. I'm not saying that you don't have any people of who, who, whose descendants came from the mainland living in the Americas. I'm not saying that, you know, of course, Brazil, but I'm definitely not saying that you don't have people like that. But a lot of this, the pioneers who came to the Caribbean, who represented Portugal, who were from Portugal, did not come from the mainland. They came from the island of Madeira. They came from Madeira. That's where they came to. When uh, Cali Reed, if I'm not mistaken, the, uh, the Presbyterian minister that I mentioned, the Scottish Presbyterian minister, his converts, when they were exiled from the island, they were sent to Trinidad. And then they left Trinidad and moved to places like New York City and they ended up in places like Indiana. When Hawaii, when the United States took over that island, um, took over that island, I might say illegally so, when they took that island over and they needed workers in the, in the, um, in the, uh, in the pineapple um, farms and so forth, they reached out to Portugal and Madeira was who supplied people to go to places like Hawaii, which is why you do have um, people of Madeiran descent as far away as living in Hawaii. And so forth. Same exact thing with the Caribbean, whether it be Demerara, which we call Guyana today, or Trinidad, or St. Kitts and Nevis, where my Madeira ancestors ended up. That's another reason why you can look at it and see how Madeira features so prominently and is rather an important island in terms of sending their people, sending its people overseas and influencing the cultures in these other places. And that is also something that's rather interesting that I had to mention, and I forgot to mention it. Here's another thing. You go to a place like British Guyana, well, Guyana, or you go to a place like St. Kitts and Nevis. Let me use Guyana where my wife is from. When you go there, the local people, the lo Guyana is a place that is known for its diversity, and they call themselves the country of six races. Um, when you go there, the people of African descent, they have their holidays that celebrate or commemorate things dealing with them. They have a large East Indian population. So when you go there, they have things like Indian Arrival Day. They have Pagua, where they throw all those colorful colors all over their clothing and so forth. They have Diwali. Those are Hindu um, 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 holidays that were brought over by the East Indians who were brought over to British Guyana. 